Так, мы продолжаем свое победоносное шествие или поездку, уж как вам угодно, по Европе. В прошлый раз я делал на скорость, а чего? <coughs> Сайт. Три раза подряд чтобы было минимум 300 километров и 25 минут на контракт. Сейчас, когда я это сделал, я уже могу сосредоточиться на более выгодных контрактах. Ну, чем мы и займемся. And if they get through, then they play Sevilla or Roma in the quarters, and then probably Man United in the semis. I mean, that's that's really tough. But you've only got to look at what they've done in the Premier League in the past two years and how they've beaten Man City twice, they've beaten Spurs, they've beaten Arsenal, they've beaten Man United, you know, they've beaten a weakened Liverpool team in the cup, and they should have claimed a point at Anfield early this season. So the way that Nuno sets them up, they are they are fearless. Every time they go onto that pitch, they are fearless and they believe that they can win every game and that's the, they, that's the approach that they'll take. Great stuff, Tim. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy it tomorrow. Tim Spires, who covers Wolves for The Athletic. And, uh, yeah, you'll be able to hear commentary on Wolves against Olympiakos live on Five Live Sport tomorrow night. Well, focus switches to the Champions League on Friday night and there's a huge clash, Manchester City against Real Madrid. Commentary on Five Live Sport. Now, he won't be involved on Friday, but uh, let's talk to Simon Stone. Uh, well, I'm sure you will be involved in some shape or form, Simon. Um, but we're, we're talking about Nathan Aki, who, who uh, City have just signed from Bournemouth. Yes, that's right. Um, £40 million pounds with an extra one in add-ons, which is quite important because... Um, Chelsea had an option to buy him for 40 million pounds, um, but Manchester City got there first, and, and Chelsea didn't want to match the deal. Ake kind of fills a hole that everybody, apart from Pep Guardiola and maybe even him, in his uh, private moments, would see that Manchester City have had in their squad throughout this season. Uh, it's a five-year deal. Um, And the Dutchman, I guess, is is going to be a first choice because City clearly um, have been deficient since the departure of uh, Vincent Company to Anderlecht at the end of last season. And, uh, and it's something that's let them down badly uh, in the title charge this year. So do you think he'll be first choice uh, alongside Emmerich Laporte next season? I do. Um, it's a strange one because they're both left-footed players and really that that's, doesn't happen very often. But I just don't see, unless he goes out and buys someone else, of course, but um, I, don't, I don't see John Stones or Nicholas Osamendi as being, um, being viable candidates to start many games given they've hardly played um, at the back end of this season. And Eric Garcia at 19 years of age Has, pl has, pl has played in front of them and Fernandinho, who's not even a defender, has played in front of them. So, yes, I would have thought Ake would go in as first choice. And it'll be interesting to see how it goes because it's a massive step up from a Bournemouth side that got relegated, even though he looked quite good on a number of occasions. Mm. Oh, and what about outgoings at Manchester United? Uh, have we seen the last of Alexis Sanchez? I think so, yes. Uh, I'm expecting that deal to be done Um, within the next 24 hours and for Sanchez to uh, join into Milan where he's been on loan all season and playing for them tonight I expect that to go through in the next 24 hours that would um, that would complete a permanent transfer it also complete one of the kind of most sorry transfer deals that United have ever been involved in four and a half year contract um, Sanchez was given £400,000 a week You would have to imagine there's been a, a huge kind of either payoff or a way that Manchester United have smoothed that deal over because Alexis Sanchez were led to believe is clearly taking a pay cut to go to Inter Milan, but you wouldn't have thought he'd just give away 400 grand a week for the remaining two two years of his contract. But yeah, I'm expecting that deal to com be completed uh, within the next 24 hours. Yeah, not been a happy story with Alexis Sanchez at Old Trafford. Thank you very much indeed, Simon Stone, our Manchester football expert. Let's uh, look a bit more in a bit more detail then at that game on Friday because Real Madrid have actually already announced their squad travelling over for the game. Gareth Bale is not in it, though. Let's speak to European football expert Pete Jensen. Uh, evening, Pete. Evening, Ellie. 
So we're not even going to see Gareth Bale messing around in the stands as a sub. So what does that tell us about his future? Well, it's maybe part of the reason why Zidane has chosen to leave him behind. He doesn't want any distractions. It's interesting that Sergio Ramos, who of course can't play in the game because he's suspended, he will travel to Manchester and Gareth can't. Um, I know that lots of people are saying, well, this must mean it's the end, this must mean it's the end. Well, we did say that last summer and he remained at the club and started and started and started the season. So it's still um, an impasse at the moment between player um, and club. It's no surprise, really. He didn't. Uh, he wasn't in the squad for the last game of the season. He didn't play in any of the final seven games of the season. In fact, he only played 102 minutes in the last 11 matches. So it's no surprise to him either, I think, that he's been left out of the, of the trip to Manchester. So could he be available, do you think, during during what's left of the summer for a Premier League club? Or, or will Real be a bit stubborn on, on uh, letting him go? I think part of the problem is that he doesn't really have any desire to, to come back to England. We know that United wants, Manchester United wanted him at, at one point um, and, and even that wasn't enough to, to turn his head. Um, he seems to be happy to just dig in. He's got uh, two years left of his contract. The only thing that might change it is we know that the one thing he still really cares about is playing for Wales. So will he want to uh, go a whole season without playing, knowing that the Euros at the, are at the end of next season? That might persuade him to try and sit down with, with Real Madrid and find a way out of the situation, but at the moment he's happy to, to stay put. Thank you so much, Pete. Pete Jensen, European football expert. So, yeah, just a reminder of that big game on Friday night. Manchester City against Real Madrid. Full commentary on Five Live Sports. Now, at the World Snooker Championship in Sheffield, Stephen Maguire is trying to avoid a first-round exit. Jamie Broughton is watching at the Crucible. Well, Stephen Maguire recently won the Tour Championship, so was in hot form, but his Crucible campaign could soon be over here. Qualifying Martin Gould has really done a job on him. Gould resumed leading by seven frames to two tonight, and he's taken the opening two frames of the evening. He's too far. Ten rem Distant studio here in Salford at Media City. Um, not quite the heights. Приветствую, мистер Небил. Приветствую. Я очень рад тебя видеть на моем скромном канале. Честно говоря, мне сегодня не хочется много болтать, потому что, несмотря на то, что ко мне мой дрожайший кузен, и я очень этому рад, тем не менее настроение не особо, потому что мое оборудование барахлит. И, как ты понимаешь, это не может меня не печалить. Поэтому мне трендить сегодня, ну, трудно будет изображать из себя счастливого стримера. Надеюсь, ты понимаешь. Так что я, пожалуй, сегодня просто послушаю радио. And Tom would certainly be one of those where they often play well for two or three weeks. He's a really good driver of the golf ball. His chipping sometimes isn't his greatest, but with long, wet, rough, that won't be a problem. He'll be comfortable. So I'm looking forward to seeing Tom Lewis cope with a major. OK, well, I know a lot of people will be watching out for Rory McIlroy. Always a lot of attention on him. He has been speaking in the last couple of hours, and here he is on how he is coping with golf post-lockdown. Honestly, for me, if anything... I
best that you can. Roy, when was the last time you signed an autograph? Uh, last last week, um, but not. I guess I I stayed in the I stayed in the Southwind community there in Memphis, and a couple of kids came to the door, and and I said, let me just go get a sharpie out of my own bag because <laughs> they came with a sharpie. So I guess last week, but again, you have to even that you go and you take your own sharpie and make sure that it's sanitized and all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, I've signed a lot less autographs uh, the last few months. I love those kids. <laughs> Great plan from them. Um, Ian, I don't think the lockdown has in any way suited Roy McIlroy, considering his four pre-lockdown. No, I mean, it's, it's difficult to judge whether or not it's, it's the strange environment that they're playing in now that has depressed his results, no top tens in the five events that he's played, or whether it was the interruption that came along because of lockdown, when up to that point he was playing with more consistency than anybody else. He went into lockdown as the world, world number one, he now goes into the first major of the year as number three in the world. And Anthony, I know we're going to be talking a lot about a couple of players in particular uh, in the preview show at nine, Bryson DeChambeau and Brooks Kepka. Interesting. They're they're a lot more similar than they know it. That's that's what I find. <laughs> they wouldn't like to hear that. No, absolutely not. But they're going to. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's it's going to be great to see, you know, the the best major performer of late. No question about it. In the last two or three years, with a with a revamped DeChambeau. Who knows? You know, and despite everything, we have so many good talking points, don't we, to get into? Um, just quickly, Ian, before we go, the Rose Ladies series. Can you bring us up to yeah, date? Yeah, ab absolutely. Alice, for notes? Uh, <laughs> no, no, I don't need them. Uh, Alice Hewson is uh, the leader. It's a three-day finale uh, after seven tournaments leading up to this point. It's been a brilliant thing. Justin Rose getting involved in it. The English woman, 22 years of age, Alice Hewson, first-round leader after a four under par 67 a couple of really big names still playing in that rather than going to America and playing on the LPGA tour Charlie Hull and former Women's British Open winner Georgia Hall they're six shots Nine overnight, Sean Masood on 46 as well, and that partnership uh, heading towards the century partnership for the third wicket. So let's talk to Atif Nawaz from the Doosra podcast. Did you enjoy what you saw today, particularly of Baba Azam? Atif, good evening. Good evening, Ellie. Yes, absolutely I did. It was fantastic to watch Barber in full flow today. He got stuck in very quickly and what were initially quite difficult batting conditions. You've got to remember, it was very overcast at the start of the day and a lot of people were kind of questioning Pakistan's decision to bat first, but when Barber got to the crease, he just looked a class apart from anything else we'd seen and uh, I dare say anything else we'd seen all summer, really, with the, the ease he's found himself at the, without the crease. It was quite extraordinary to watch. Just for people who haven't seen him bat yet, and, and you've got no excuse actually because um, the, the highlights of the day's play will be on the iPlayer before too long and they're on the BBC Sport website right now. Just describe what Baba does that makes him so special. He's got this incredible poise and balance at the crease and he just looks so classy, particularly when he plays his cover drive, which is right up there with the best in the game at the moment and, you know, really in the context of the modern game and certainly of recent times. And also, he just looks so balanced. He's one of those players that looks like he's never quite rushed. When you consider he's got the likes of, you know, Jimmy Anderson, Stuart Broad, Joffre Archer, Chris Wokes, a really...
Test Series in almost a decade. And, you know, he's very balanced to the young man. And, you know, he's so quick as well. Obviously, he bowls 90 plus miles an hour, age 17. You expect him to get faster as he gets a little bit older and stronger but already showing that kind of that maturity out there with the ball that that level-headedness and that very strategic approach to the game that kind of you know it's beyond his years really and of course Shaheen Shah Afridi who sort of gets slightly less build up than Nassim Shah uh, owing to the age factor but he is a very special bowler as well. And just a very quick word about the, about the spinners as well, because as we've said, uh, England will be will be batting last on what could be a dry wicket. Yeah, it's absolutely. But again, it was a gamble from Pakistan to play two leg spinners in the side, uh, particularly Shadab Khan, who hasn't played a Test cricket for quite some time. But it's uh, it may well pay off. I mean, there's a very long tail for for Pakistan, but if the top order can deliver, Pakistan will be in a very strong position as the game uh, pitch deteriorates at Old Trafford. Great stuff, Atif. Thank you very much indeed. That's Atif Namaz from the Doozra podcast. TMS back on air 10.15 tomorrow morning. Live text and commentary and video clips as usual via the BBC Sport website and app. And still to come between now and 10.30 on 5 Live Sport, it's the Match of the Day Top 10 pod featuring Jan Franco Zola. And up next, it's 5 Live Formula One with Jenny Gao and the team ahead of the 70th anniversary Grand Prix at Silverstone. On digital, BBC Sounds, smart speaker and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. BBC News at 8 o'clock. This is Nikki Cardwell. The UK has announced a £5 billion aid package for Lebanon following yesterday's huge explosion. После паузы я продолжаю. Так, о, ты нам что-то написал. Ну давай, посмотрим, что там у тебя. Charlotte Winfield reports. Lissy Harper has vowed to fight for a change in the law in memory of her late husband. Уж не знаю, как там лисички называются по французски, но по русски они называются лисички. The campaign for Andrew's law is being supported by the Police Federation of England and Wales. Mrs Harper is now calling on the public and politicians of all parties to back it. Almost choked on the food, which was prepared at the chain's Aldershot branch yesterday. Cricket and England have had a difficult opening day in the first test against Pakistan at Old Trafford. At the end of play, which was cut short because of rain and bad lights, the visitors were 139 for two. And the weather, it'll be dry and muggy for most of us tonight, once, and the, once any showers from the UK have cleared. BBC News, it's three minutes past eight. BBC Sounds. Boost your mood with six hours of pure happiness. A seamless selection of songs to make you smile. From nostalgic 90s tracks to bangers that love your belting out a tune in no time. The all-day happy mix.
mix. This has made me feel very joyful indeed. Listen now on the BBC Sounds app. Another race weekend at Silverstone, another chance for Lewis Hamilton to stretch his legs at the top of the championship. But will it have the drama of last week, 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 last week? Ah, when the radio blows, it's not good. And I'm joined by Julian Palmer. Uh, plenty to pack in as usual. We discuss the latest on the progress against Racing Point, and uh, we also talk about how tough it is when a driver loses confidence. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of it. Но все равно есть, есть, так сказать, каналы, по которым вино, по которым хорошее французское вино, а может попасть в Россию. И это замечательно. Ну, его попадает немного, но тем не менее. He didn't have huge pressure immediately. He had. He had no pressure immediately. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a, yeah, literally no pressure. That was the problem. But he had 34 seconds back to Max Verstappen, so that there was no need to panic at that stage. But then, obviously, when the tire is sparking, you then got the risk of doing further damage to the car as well with the flailing rubber on the left front. It's quite a long lap at Silverstone as well, 3k, and. It's for a Grand Prix win, so um, it, it was close. In the end, he uh, he managed to nurse it back. It's difficult to, to judge the pace. No one ever sees the data compare of two cars both driving with punctures. Ironically, Mercedes actually will have done this weekend, but um, it's difficult to judge that. He was very quick. I looked through the, the data trace on, on F1 analysis that I did this week. He was actually as quick through the, the left-hander of Vale as he was the lap before, basically, turning into the apex with a punctured left front. Um, so that was pretty impressive. But of course, on the left-handers, the right front takes most load. He did the job. That's what counts. And could anyone have done what Hamilton did that weekend? Or does that, once again, highlight just how good Hamilton is? Well, it's hard to say, Jenny, because it's such a rare experience. I mean, we should remember that two laps before, Bottas pretty much did exactly the same thing. He got his car back actually from further away than Hamilton. His tire broke, uh, failed uh, sort of approaching turn, th uh, sort of around turns two and three. So he had to do almost a complete entire lap and he got back without badly damaging his car. Hamilton's broke, uh, lost pressure two kilometers into the lap. So there were 3.8 kilometers left and he was 22 seconds slower over that 3.8 kilometers than he had been on the lap before. And of course, there's some very fast corners to go through uh, during that period. There's, there's the long uh, left-hander at Luffield, which is quite slow. Then you've got Cops, uh, very fast. The Beckett swerves and then Stowe, all of which would have put a lot of weight on that um, left front tire. So I, I don't think we should, certainly shouldn't diminish what he did. And, you know, it was, it's one of, it was a kind of heroic moment, wasn't it? And it's something that um, I think is going to go down in, in Formula One history as one of the most remarkable, extraordinary finishes to a Grand Prix ever. I mean, Mark, you've traveled the world with Formula One working as a mechanic. Have you had those moments in the garage where it's been as tense as it would have been for the Mercedes team watching their two drivers? I've had a, the only thing I can equate to being somewhat similar is working with Kimi Raikkonen uh, back in the day when uh, at the Nurburgring, Formula One fans will remember we were leading the race 
and actually for very different reasons our right front tyre exploded in fact it was the entire suspension on the right corner exploded in that instance there was no way we were getting back to the garage because it pitched him off into a high speed spin uh, and way off the circuit so I do know what it feels like to go through that emotion on the final lap when you're so close to victory um, actually there was a scenario that somebody mentioned to me the other day that, that could, the only one thing I could think that have made, could have made the ending more dramatic on Sunday was had Verstappen not made that uh, late stop for his, um, to go for the fastest lap there could have been a scenario where Verstappen could have kept going also had a blowout because it was happening to, to a number of cars and who could have had Verstappen versus Lewis limping round on three wheels with heavily disabled cars to the finish which I think would have been the slow race to the flag that would have been epic surely from um, mechanics point of view as well we had Bottas and Sainz pit with punctures mechanics by this stage are surely sort of thinking their job's done unless you're you're in the mix to pit for a for a, for a set of softs and go for fastest lap which Verstappen was yeah. the Mercedes mechanics must have been knowing there's no imminent pit stop coming and just do you ever yeah. take your, your sort of head well, out of the game for a little bit there you don't crack the beers open and, and pull out the cigars quite at that point <laughs> but um you know you are sort of relaxing you, you know it's a good point you, you're sort of taking your, your helmet off your pit stop helmet your balaclava you are pretty relaxed i have to say but the moment bottas's car had the failure i would imagine the entire <laughs> pit stop crew would have had a serious wake-up call and, and i've been in those situations where normally probably the team manager would have come onto the radio and said right boys get ready and you are literally then in panic mode trying to pull your balaclava on nobody can got even time to straighten it up you half got your, your crash helmet on and ready to leap out into the pit lane so it would have been some fairly tense moments i'm sure for those guys andrew just tell us what we know what pirelli have said since the events uh, well they've basically blamed where which is interesting because before the race none of the teams had been given any indication that 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 that, so that, that stint length uh, that they did was, even though it was an early stop because of the safety car, would have been a problem in terms of durability. Um, but I, I was on a, a, a call with Mar Mario Isola, the Pirelli Formula One boss, yesterday, and he basically said that the that early, that the tyres, the first stint tyre should have gone another five or six or even eight laps, probably. And that would have given the second stint tyres that bit of extra breathing space. Um, because Silverstone's a very, very demanding uh, track on tyres because of all the high-speed corners and, and also the, the, the low-speed corners are also quite long so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of demand on the tyre through most of the corners on the track and that left front really gets hammered through the, the really quick corners like Cops and Beckett's and Stowe. Um, so they, they say it was uh, where, basically, although the tyres, uh, they saw cuts on, some of them were quite deep, some of them weren't, um, but they, the t they say the failures themselves were not caused France, by, um, uh, by the cuts, but by, uh, by over, over long use, basically, even though it wasn't supposed to be over long before the race. Just one point that people might not have picked up on, the safety car that led to the early pit stop that led to the long stint that led to the puncture, was triggered by Daniel Kvyat crashing uh, on the entry to Magus and Beckett's, uh, basically flat out. And at the time, the team blamed a driver error for that. They said he was making a switch change on his steering wheel. Turns out, was uh, seen from the rear-facing camera of, um, on the car, he had a right rear failure entering that corner. And that hasn't been explained by Pirelli yet. Um, so. I think overall it's obviously not a hugely comfortable situation for anybody to be in. And as Jolien wrote in his column on the BBC Sport website this morning, uh, all the engineers and tears 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 To point out just quickly with the tyres, Pirelli obviously talked about wear, and that's a, you know, it is valid, as you say, long stints, really demanding circuit, particularly on that left front. But the other point to, to be noted is that these cars this year are the fastest Formula One cars we've ever had. And the other point is that the tyres we're using this year are the tyres that, of course, were designed for the 2019 cars last year. They were they were spec for that car. Uh, they've been carried over um, because, of course, we. Everything's been put on hold in that we thought we were going to get uh, brand new cars with 2021. That's been delayed. 
because of cost saving and everything else. We've put this, these these tyres that were designed for the 2019 cars who are now due to, to do 2019, 2020 and the 2021 season. And Don't already you're really no? getting twitchy no, because no. the performance has taken such a leap forward with most teams. Um, and that, therefore the loads no, that come through those tyres are dramatically increased to the point where they're already looking at making changes not only to the cars Same next year to reduce downforce, but Pirelli looking to make changes to the tyres to just give them a bit more integrity, given the level of performance increase we're already seeing. We already saw, so in um, British Grand Prix 2017, both Ferraris had left front issues, didn't they, in the closing stages? I mean, I can't actually really remember because I'd left the track by, by the end of the race, but I remember one of them went off the road at Luff. Почему ее радио ты? Упырь. 